Hello, everybody, and welcome to Enterprise Sales Development. I'm your host, Eric Quanstrom, the CMO at Science. Today's episode, well, you're going to love it. <laughs> and the reason why is because our guest is Taft Love. Uh, great name, by the way. Taft has a world of experience in the sales development space. We're going to talk about his entry into the market, um, how he got there. I don't don't want to spoil the story because it's a good one. Um but he's headed up uh, sales development teams at PandaDoc, at Smart Recruiters, has a lot of experience. He actually runs his own company right now called Iceberg RevOps. Um, and we talk a little bit about that as well. Fun discussion around um, some controversial, maybe even counterintuitive opinions formed while heading up these organizations. In fact, one of the things you'll hear Taft talk about and go into great detail about is the invisible funnel and how sometimes the KPIs that we follow in sales development can really lead us astray. In fact, he gives tangible examples of KPIs that we should be inventing and following and really discussing and moving forward if we wanna be effective at our sales development and prospecting efforts. So you're gonna to wanna to listen for that because this is a, an interview from a very wise, um, <clears throat> kind of well-studied individual that knows his stuff. So without further ado, here's Taft Love. And we're back with Taft Love. Uh, Taft, by the way, great name. Like, can you ever forget? <laughs> did you have? Do you ever have people say, "I can never forget your name" because it's so iconic? Dude, uh, I I hear that sometimes, but it gets better than that. So, uh, my partner uh, is a doctor. So she's uh, and she's weekly. So weekly and love. So she hyphenated. So her psychiatry business is weekly love. No and, way. <laughs> and yeah. Wow. So we, uh, you can't make uh, that S up. No, no, you can't. I, I remember my dad always telling me like, you need to, you should be a doctor. You need to be a doctor. You, you're clearly not smart enough in school, but you should be a doctor. And then, uh, then I <laughs> went on to become, uh, as you know, officer and detective and agent love. <laughs> so got close. Well, I think that's a great place to start because, you know, and we'll get to some of your resume and experiences and, yeah. and ample experience in the sales development space, but you came to kind of like this industry from a very um, arcane angle. And yes. it's not every day that that we have patrol officers turn detectives, you know, <laughs> kind of like making the, the switch into sales. Yeah. Uh, so I because when I was 19, I knew better than everybody else in the world. Uh, I knew everything better than everyone else. So I dropped out of college. You were the only 19 year old that felt that way, by the way. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Uh, dropped out of college, went to police academy, became a patrol officer in small town, North Carolina, and pretty quickly realized that was really dumb. But I was off the payroll. That was the deal. Like you can, you can drop out of school, but you're off the payroll forever. Like that, that's your choice. And, and so it ended up being the best mistake I ever made. It, it forced me to deal with the real world at a younger age than most people. And it became a, a patrol officer, as you know, and, and that lit a fire that I had never had before. So made detective, I was the youngest person in my, in my department's history to become a detective. And then became a uh, uh, cross sworn as a federal agent on a on a task force in the in the southeast region, and so it it was it laid the groundwork for what became a career elsewhere by kind of jumping into the fire based on a bad decision. Well, hey, and then you detoured over to Korea for a couple of years. That's right. The economy was was still in the tank I, around 2010, 2011. And I, uh, I had gotten and then had rescinded an offer from the Secret Service because the the uh, the congressional budget wasn't passed in time. And so they rescinded their offer of employment after I thought I was leaving for the academy. And I was tired of I made less than thirty thousand dollars a year in 2011 or whatever. And so I threw up my hands and said, I'm going to go do something interesting. I can't stay here living hand to mouth working as a police officer. And yeah, spent a couple of years in Korea riding out the end of the recession before coming back to the States. So, I mean, you could say like stranger in a strange land being yeah. kind of like on the, on the force, you walked into the SDR role 
like at that point, maybe way yeah. more prepared than any other career transitioner of all time. I maybe so. Yeah, I, I was I was part of a class of three SDRs, two of whom were recent Ivy League grads who were sort of the classic anointed tech bro. My dad is a VP at whatever SaaS company. And uh, I I didn't realize it at the time. I was pretty intimidated by that background, having come from a totally different one. But I found out pretty quickly I was much better prepared and and had a different perspective than people who sort of felt, honestly felt entitled to what they had. I, I felt so, so lucky to be there at at 30, making no money as an SDR at a, at a tiny startup. <laughs> well, I, I would think it would be the exact opposite where they would have been intimidated by you, right? Like uh, someone with worldly wise experience and seen kind of the other side of the world, you know what I mean? Like, isn't that how it always works though? You you're intimidated by them and they're intimidated by you for different <laughs> reasons, but you know, it's, uh, uh, it, it was an interesting time, but, but a formative one. So when you, when you're making cold calls as an SDR, after being a former, you know, detective, I imagine you've got a wealth of interrogation skills that you've, you've built. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I wish it had translated. It, uh, it turns out I, I had more trouble swallowing my ego and oh. dealing with people hanging up on me and telling me no, having come from a, a career as a, as a police officer where you react differently to people not being very nice to you. Uh, you have to yeah. just, you're always of, in control. You're always in control. And as an SDR, you know, Josh Braun always talks about sort of detached from the outcome and yeah. I didn't know to do that early on. And it, it took learning it the hard way. I wish I had, I wish I had known who Josh was 10 years ago and, <laughs> and could have understood that earlier. Yeah. He, he was a great guest. Uh, was on about a year ago and um, definitely hit, hit that note. And a lot of others that I think are foundational concepts within the sales development space. Um, so maybe we even fast forward because I think that there's sure. um, a story that's, waiting to be told here around. So you progress from SDR to ultimately becoming the director of sales development over at Pandadoc, a brand that I think everyone yeah. in the space is familiar with. Then moving on to smart recruiters where you were the global director of, of sales development. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously some, some really robust kind of like validated roles where you've seen mm -hmm. kind of sales development programs at a very high level. Yeah. And yet, um, and I guess this is the, the great tease, if you will, <laughs> you feel as though a great majority of the, of the world that run SDR programs are doing it all wrong. Why? So there's this concept at Iceberg, we're, we're sort of batting around the idea of calling it the invisible funnel. And there is a funnel in sales development that no one is measuring. And so... Uh, a setup here is if you've ever been to a like the outreach conference or any sales development conference, Rainmaker, any of those, you've probably walked around and heard conversation after conversation after conversation about metrics that, while important, in a vacuum are meaningless. Well, I, I, what's your best open rate? How, what's the, how often do people pick up when you call them? And uh, the reason that these are our focus is because they're the metrics that are easiest to measure. They're the ones that outreach and to a lesser degree, Salesforce, make it easy to click a few buttons and and see these metrics. And you go into outreach and they've done some cool stuff where they now have a funnel view where it's how many people did you, are you sort of reaching out to and how many answered you and how many of those, you know, uh, took a meeting. And these are all person and activity centric, but we sell to companies. Right. We don't sell to individuals. And the, the, the way I like to explain this, because this is a place where I think, I think sometimes I start to lose people in the distinction. And so let me give you a concrete example of why these are the wrong metrics to, to focus on without considering the invisible funnel, which is the, the company funnel. So let's take two sales development reps. They both make a hundred calls, send a hundred emails, and they each reach out to 50 people this week. Okay. And let's say they both set two oper set two new meetings or create two opportunities that go to the account executive team. 
so they've had the same week, right? They're, it's the same. Except what if I told you that that Rep A sent these emails and calls and reached out to the 50 people across 50 companies. So one person per company, Yelp, calling gas stations in Wisconsin. The other one reached out to four companies, 25 people each, all from the Fortune 1000. Well, now those weeks look very, very different. Those two meetings probably have wildly different potential values. The the strategy was totally different. There are a lot of things that are very different about their weeks. But if you focus on the metrics that we talk about all day long, they were the right. same week. Yep. Yeah, it and, makes complete sense. And that's the the invisible funnel. And what uh, I had uh, I had a conversation one time a couple years ago, and and not to give this person a hard time, I'm not going to name and shame here, but a well known sales trainer, a, a a solid thinker in our space. I was explaining this and I said, there are things that companies not only don't measure, but they don't know how to measure today. Like how many companies did my outbound team, AE sales development, whatever, how many companies did my outbound team start prospecting this month? And if you don't know your way around sort of the architecture of Salesforce, you might think like, oh, it's, there's gotta be a field for that. But I promise you there's not. Right. And the reason for that is an outbound reps, the, the outbound motion is spread across five objects. So you have accounts, which are the companies, contacts, which are the people, opportunities, which are the deals, and then activities and events, assuming you do meetings and events and calls and emails and activities. That's five different objects. And Salesforce is actually not good at helping you aggregate all that data in a meaningful way. There is a lot of work required to sort of roll all that data up into a single record, like the opportunity. It's why a VP of sales worth his or her salt can like rattle off their stats, say, oh, well, our close rate is this and our stage one to stage two conversion rate is that because it's all living on one single record. But outbound is spread across five records. And so it's hard to measure these things. Like how many did we start prospecting today? How many of those talked to us? How many of those took a meeting? How many of those meetings became opportunities? You can sort of link how many people did we reach out to? That's easy to measure to how many opportunities did we create? But again, back to the two rep scenario, that isn't enough to actually understand the value of what your team's doing. Yeah, I think you're onto something here because I think that in addition to this idea that not all meetings are created equal, yeah, which is, I, I think, the, the main thrust of the, the point, um, I've long believed, and I think the trend line is unmistakable depending on like what stats, including your own business, you follow, but it's emphasized by Gartner and Sirius and every analyst firm on the face of the planet, that the buying group itself has changed dramatically. Yeah. And most so in enterprise companies. So that, you know, <laughs> I oftentimes laugh and, and we have this, um, this is going to go super into the weeds for just a second. Hopefully we can pop <laughs> yeah, yeah. back out. But I always laugh when like, we'll set up an outbound campaign and, you know, the, the companies that we prospect into say will be like 5,000 employees or more. And even if we feel like we're getting contact dense, Right. Like, oh, there was five people in this outbound campaign. I'm like, oh, right. So that's 0.0001% of that organization. <laughs> yeah. The very definition of skimming, if you really think about like <laughs> penetrating an account. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, and that's so kind true. of riding sidecar with everything you're saying, isn't it? It is. And and it's funny you mentioned that particular stat because at smart recruiters, so the the rest of this story is that smart recruiters. I realize we're, we're missing this. We're missing the boat here. Stop talking to me about how many calls you made. That's important, but that, but in a vacuum, it doesn't matter. Same with any other metric. And without talking to me about the companies and the invisible funnel, we're not having a productive conversation. And so what I did was I went and sort of rigged up this really hacky system that didn't work well enough to scale at all where I, I used roll up helper to move data from one object to the next and on the account record, sort of had all of this information bubble up to a single record where I could say, hey, how many, 
contacts have we started reaching out to in the last X days? And suddenly the account becomes your, the account record allows you to report on a funnel. And it broke down pretty quickly. What I figured out was that there were, there was no mechanism that allowed you to, to do this scalably because any roll up app scans every single record in your entire system to see which ones meet certain criteria. So it didn't take long for our 2 million activity records to take eight days for it to scan one time. So our data is at best eight days old and super confusing and, and these apps break down. And so, um, but what I eventually did was went and myself built an app that is a little more elegant. You can install into Salesforce and we put it on the shelf for a couple of years because Iceberg started growing quickly and services was making enough money. We didn't need to focus on other things. But one of the metrics that surfaces is how many contacts did you start approaching whenever you start approaching a company? And so what is your contact density? That's a really hard question to answer in Salesforce unless you go manually click into an account and look at the activities against all of the contacts. It's it's prohibitively manual yeah. to, to answer this question at scale. And so if you can't do that, you're, as you said, like contact density. And once you can answer this stuff, you can answer or, or have all this stuff in a single object. You can start asking and answering some really cool questions like, hey, when we're successful with outbound, what's the average number of contacts we, we reached out to before setting the opportunity? Like what's the contact density that actually works for us? Right. Um, Smart Recruiters, which had at the time a really big sales development program, they let me install this app and and use it for free even after I left in exchange for keeping the data. So I had I, a year or two ago, I did this deep dive into the data. I anonymized it. They let me pull it out without any any data about who they were reaching out to and just the statistics like when did the outreach start? When did it end? Which ones were successful? Things like that. And these really interesting things that were totally counter to what I hear out in the world all the time started to surface. You've heard uh, on av- I'll you just have to you reach- up. Yeah, yeah, thanks. You have to reach out to you know the average uh, the average response comes after eleven touches. Well, that's probably true. I mean, you can make statistics say almost anything you want, and chances are, if you just pull all attempts together, that's probably true. But when when the, that team was successful, the average number of touches was much, much lower. Yeah. And it turns out if your timing is on, I, I've, I, my hypothesis is you got to do two things to get outbound right. You have to have decent timing and not screw up. <laughs> and if you do those two things, you're probably going to be okay. And, and a way I, I sort of explain this to people is like, which would you, which would you rather do? Eric, if I told you, you can reach out to the right person at the right company with an amazing message, but at the wrong time. Or if you could reach out to somebody near the right person at a good company with like an okay message and your timing was spot on, which would you rather do? Timing all day long. Absolutely. And that's the very genesis of intent. If you really, (laughs) that's right. That's, That's absolutely right. Well, and what's, what's funny is you posed the question to me and, you know, Technically, I'm one of the bad guys because I'm a marketer and, (laughs) and, you know, some sales development teams roll up to marketing, but most don't. Um, But all marketers served up that question will always answer the exact same way because marketers are forever thinking about demand gen. And most of us practice at the, the church of inbound at some point in time where we forever in a day want people that are raising their hands as opposed to people with hands that are folded and crossed and you know, like sure. <laughs> potentially <laughs> signaling uh, the, the body language of, no, I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> and this actually reminds me of another thing, and this is getting a little off topic, but maybe, maybe interesting to wander a little bit. Uh, at Smart Recruiters specifically, but then like everywhere else I've been, this has happened. I don't know how many times I, uh, so I ran sales development and sales operations. I had this weird dual role and that meant that I was the one who got called in to get uh, fussed at when we missed a deal for multiple reasons, because the system should have helped surface that a deal was happening and you own the team that should know that a deal is happening. 
And multiple times our CEO would call me in and say, hey, guess what? Nike just bought Workday. And I go, oh, geez. <laughs> oh, no. And he's like, you know, I looked in the system. We talked to Nike uh, about this time last year. And I'm like, oh, no. And he'd say, well, uh, anyway, we missed it. How do we miss it? <laughs> and almost every time, almost every time I would go talk to the rep. Sometimes they were, sometimes they weren't even at the company anymore. And I'd go look through Salesforce and I'd find somewhere deep in the notes that they're, you know, they're on some other system and will there, people generally tell you if they're, if, if you ask about timing and stuff as a sales development rep. And so many times this data was just lost. Yeah. And this is another thing teams get Very wrong. Very deep is, in a field in Salesforce, never to be recovered or searched on again. Yeah. And, or worse yet, in someone's calendar as a reminder set for next June for 6 a.m. I used to do that. I'd put 6 a.m. was when I just put all of my reminders for who I need to reach out to today. And that was like my little hack for knowing who to talk to first. And it's something that almost everybody gets wrong. This, this great data just has nowhere to go that's built to be a good repository for this. And it's another thing we did at Smart Recruiters and it took me getting beat up a few times to realize like this, this has to be fixed. Um, we created this concept of snoozing an account that was, we called them activated accounts when you're reaching out. And there were three ways for them to become deactivated. One is they just time out, nobody responds after X amount of time. The second is they take a meeting and you sort of, that invisible funnel stops tracking because now you're in the funnel that everyone uses, the opportunity funnel. Mm -hmm. And the third was we wrote a snooze button and you click snooze and it pops up and it says, hey, who have you been talking to? And you choose contacts. And then it says, what are your notes? And then it says, on what date should this pop back up? That's smart. And now if that person leaves the company, that's okay. It's not hidden in their calendar, which has been deprecated. It's not hidden in notes somewhere in Salesforce. There is a place for you to put it. Um, another thing we sort of built into this app that we're at some point going to relaunch, but it's like two of the biggest problems are measuring the wrong data and failing to properly capture and nurture information is what's killing a lot of these teams. Yeah. You know, it's funny too, a, a correlated thought on that. Um, in my experience, re-engagement campaigns are almost always twice, if not three times as effective as kind of like your standard campaign, largely because perhaps the timing is just different, <laughs> if not more right. Yeah. I, you know, it's it's interesting. I've another thing that that became clear to me at Smart Recruiters, and this is this is not true for a Yelp that has an unlimited ICP, and you can just you can almost never run out of accounts. But for a company that needs to be, not to say that that Yelp doesn't have to be strategic, but needs to be strategic in the sense that there is a limit to their to their potential buyers, and you have to be kind of thoughtful about who you reach out to and when. Another thing I think companies miss on is not doing a good job of, of having sort of a rinse and repeat cycle built into their CRM so that uh, you should have the ability to tell your CRM, I want to, I want any account that doesn't buy from me this time around via outbound, I want them to be resurfaced X months later and prioritized. And that is how you should be thinking about this invisible funnel should also involve putting companies that didn't buy back in the top of it in regular increments. And your planning should be based around how many companies do we reach out to on average per month and how many reps do we have and how many months will it take to get through our entire ICP. And that's how many months should be that in, in like in months later, right. Dump them back in the top of the funnel that's the sort of planning that if you don't measure that funnel, you really can't do. Yeah. And it's simple math. It's just a yeah. question of actually doing it. <laughs> yeah. It's not hands around the rocket it. surgery. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's the problem. Isn't that nobody gets it or nobody, nobody is willing. It's that the actual measurement to sort of illuminate that funnel is, is hard to do. Yep. Um, 
which is, I think, a perfect corollary or a, a tee up, if you will. So yeah. let, let's move on to the topic of, you know, you're you founded a company called Iceberg RevOps. And, mm -hmm. you know, these, these are the kind of problems that you're solving for companies every day, aren't they? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. We uh, our sort of sweet spot, if you will, is small companies that are between founder selling and reaching a level of maturity where they can hire a qualified keyword qualified in-house operations team. And uh, so we work with a lot of funded startups, not all funded startups, but a lot of funded SaaS companies who know that, that a single Salesforce admin cannot actually own operations for them, but they need help with this stuff. So what do they do before they can spend, you know, 250. I, I talked to a guy the other day. I, I won't call him out because I'm going to talk specific numbers here, but uh, head of RevOps for small companies. And he was like, yeah, I, I'm not going to talk to companies that aren't willing to pay 300K for me. And that's the going rate for a, for top tier talent. And so what what are your choices other than the the Salesforce admin who can't really get the job done hiring a plumber to build your whole house or hiring a 300k person who isn't going to do the wrench work so you're at half a million a year to get the team you need to build our goal was to sort of be the the gap fill there for for companies wondering that question good on that guy for being able to defend his uh, value i suppose <laughs> he got a job a week after we talked he had he had no trouble with it uh he went to a series b company that could afford him and i have a feeling he's driving plenty of plenty of value to justify his his existence. Well, and, and it raises more of a, a navel gazing question around, yeah. are we at peak tech in the sales development space? I'd love to get your expert opinion on, on a question like that, a cheeky question, but one, yeah. one meant to get, uh, to tease out kind of an opinion or two. Here's what I think is happening. Uh, this is looking ahead, total speculation here, but if you back up 10 or 15 years, Salesforce initially had the vision of being the one-stop shop that HubSpot is trying to be today. And they pretty quickly figured out that no, the app exchange is actually their moat and best of breed plugged into Salesforce as your sort of central source of truth is the way the wind was blowing for a long time. And so, you know, you don't use Salesforce mass email, you use outreach and you don't use, you don't build your commission tracking in Salesforce, you get exactly and, 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 and. And so uh, I think we've seen this proliferation of tools and simultaneously as the buying group has changed in companies and the way people buy fundamentally has changed. So have the strategies of selling to companies and the world is changing so fast that it's created this proliferation of tools. And now Iceberg partly exists because nobody knows how to build a tool stack. It, it is its own it is its own skill set, just knowing how to piece together and make this tool stack work in a way that's aligned with with your business goals. And I think there's going to come a time in the not too distant future when we see a contraction. Yeah. Well, you're already seeing outreach doing what several other apps do. And I, so I think that's the I, I don't think we're at peak tech, but I think peak tech is not more tools. I think the other thing that, that we've got is a huge tsunami known as AI on top of this. And and virtually all other <laughs> types of of software um, going forward. I I'm going to be that guy. Uh, I don't know what I'm talking about here, so uh, I don't know enough about AI to be an expert by any means. I may be totally wrong, but I can't. And a lot of people have have shouted that this is incorrect, but I think we're heading to, into peak hype cycle about AI, and I think. For sure. I think we're going to settle somewhere much different than what people are imagining. I have yet to see, I have yet to see really clear evidence of AI fundamentally changing how we work. And it is developing quickly. It is pretty amazing. I, not to say that I'm not excited about it, but it's good. I'm going to take some convincing because right now AI is just like some BS letters people people in marketing tag on to what their tool does without any real connection to the tech that is AI. Fair enough. Maybe we'll have to have a separate side <laughs> discussion on all the use cases <laughs> yeah. um, going forward. Cause that's an interesting perspective. And, and one that, you know, I think um, 
you definitely have a a, a Gartner like hype cycle or is it Gartner? Yeah, I don't even remember. Yeah, analyst it is. firm. But yes, um, the trail of disappointment will be very interesting for AI. <laughs> <laughs> I I think it's deeper than people will be deeper than people realize and and I am totally open to being corrected. <laughs> and, yeah, and I, I, I might be wrong. The more interesting area there is, um, especially with the written word. I think that, you know we, we mm-hmm. we've seen voice come in and and the analysis part of you know kind of any conversational intelligence software. AI can definitely influence and, and make better. Um, where I think that the the inflection points will really come is in email analysis and response rates, engagement rates, if you will, um, going forward. Sentiment analysis feels like one of the lowest hanging fruit and it's what every company is struggling with. It, it wasn't yeah. that long ago that, that outreach and sales loft and everybody else was trying to build a... a up, down, neutral button on every email so that you mark the the sentiment. And so, yeah, I, I think if you can reliably get that data via AI, that's a huge, huge win. It definitely is. It definitely is. Well, Taft, this has been kind of a fun discussion to get like some really cool counter opinions as to the the world that, you know, we kind of know and love here, sales development. For folks yeah. that may want to engage with you on kind of the iceberg front, or just get into a conversation with you, um, where should they go? It's a good question. So icebergops.com, icebergops.com is our website. It's not up yet, but by the time this episode airs, you you might be able to find a page where the best way to, to interact with us is to sign up for one of our, uh, one of our AMAs with me. And so- okay. The idea is if you're a if you're a small business looking for help thinking through some operational problems, this isn't a sales pitch so much as a free hour of my time to help you think through something, of course, with the hope that it's impressive enough that you decide to to hire us. But even if you don't, it's it's my time for free uh, to work through problems. And or, or you pick guys that make 300K and whatever their hourly is. So. Yeah, go find go find one of those guys, <laughs> and uh, you can find me on on LinkedIn Taft Love. If you if you connect with me, just mention this podcast so that I I don't think you're spam and gonna pitch me. And um, and otherwise, uh, feel free to uh, feel free to to shoot me a message. And I I love talking ops, talking shop with anybody out there. I love it. Thank you so much. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me.